under Governor Walls is emergency declaration. So we're holding this meeting virtually as opposed to in person um, under the statute, Minnesota statutes 13D-021. If people would like to provide comments to us, they can at public.info at metc.state.mn.us. The meeting is also being uh, live streamed and recorded uh, for people to be able to monitor the meeting and uh, and see what uh, what was decided and what was what was determined. So, with that, can we call the roll to see if we have uh, quorum? Barber here. Gonzalez here. Johnson here. Lee here. Lilligren here. Muse Ferguson here. Thank you. Thank you. With that, we have quorum. Are there any adjustments to the agenda of the meeting? All right, seeing none, we will go forward with the agenda that we have. Can I get a motion to approve the minutes of the March 10th meeting? Lilligren moves approval. Johnson seconds. Sec okay. Any comments, changes? All right, can we call the roll, please? Barber. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Lee. Aye. Lilligren. Aye. Ferguson. Aye. Thank you. All right, the motion carries. So we have one business item and two information items under our agenda today. The first item is a budget amendment, business item 2021-57 JT, the first quarter budget amendment. Stuart. Mr. Chair, I believe OEO is going to start with a quick presentation on one aspect of their amendment. Okay. If OEO is speaking, we can't hear them. Hi there, this is Guthrie Byard, uh, the council's ADA and Title VI administrator within the Office of Equal Opportunity. Can you hear me? We can, yes. Okay. Um, so I apologize for being uh, late to this meeting. Um, so what I wanted to provide this committee is an overview of the ADA improvements that have occurred over the last couple of years uh, and to provide uh, a uh, review of the work that is outstanding this year and the budget request to be able to complete the ADA improvement projects. Um, so I am not sure who is in control of the presentation, but if you're able to move on uh, next slide. All right, thank you. So as far as the background goes, um, so in order to uh, ensure that the council is in compliance in particular with Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, in 2019, uh, I uh, led an effort to conduct an ADA self-evaluation uh, for the, the last half of that year where we brought in a vendor, J uh, JQP Incorporated, an MCOM vendor, to actually go to all of our facilities uh, with a level uh, with, uh, a, a, uh, you know, with a pen and pad to be able to uh, review the physical accessibility of our, of our facilities. And each facility received uh, its own uh, report on all of the barriers uh, that were identified. Uh, and uh, that led to what's called an ADA transition plan, also a requirement under Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act that uh, relates to, um, to state and local governments. And that ADA transition plan is available uh, on the ADA and accessibility website uh, within uh, Metropolitan Council's main uh, website. And that is a document that's updated annually that reviews uh, that initial self-evaluation, but in particular, it provides uh, a breakdown of the uh, work that the uh, divisions have done to address and to remediate uh, the barriers. And it also provides 
uh, a rundown of the goals and the projects that, that those uh, divisions have set for themselves uh, for that particular year. And so uh, that is nearing co completion right now, the, the update to that document here. Um, and uh, when this work first started, there was money that was set aside, uh, nearly $2 million to uh, address any ADA improvement efforts that we had identified. And this also included some digital accessibility efforts as well to make sure that we were brought up to compliance with uh, what's called web content accessibility guidelines with our websites and with our, uh, with our applications. And I'll talk a bit more about that here. Uh, so if you can move on to the next slide. So just wanted to highlight quickly community engagement. So this didn't operate in a vacuum. We wanted to make sure that uh, we were connecting with uh, community members about this work as it ultimately impacts them. Uh, and we wanted to get input uh, from them on how they view the accessibility uh, of our efforts. And for the most part, folks felt as if our uh, work was accessible, that our uh, facilities were accessible, that our uh, policies and our procedures were accessible. Uh, and um, we were very appreciative of the feedback that we got. We got nearly 600 comments uh, from both staff and community members. So it was a robust uh, turnout and very informative of the uh, of our work the, uh, thus far. So next slide, please. So as I mentioned, each facility received a report and those report findings were based on a kind of a one to four scale uh, of significance for that barrier, priority one being the most significant. So this is where you're seeing uh, the most public use, um, the greatest impact to accessing a program or service. Uh, over 3,000 barriers were identified and priority three was the most common severity. So that'd be like uh, the height of a sharps container and needing to adjust the, the location and the height of that sharps container. It might be off by two inches or so. Uh, and those reports are what is used by each uh, division, primarily Metro Transit and Environmental Services uh, being most public uh, to prioritize their projects. Uh, the, as it relates to Metro Transit, uh, the findings were also added to their transit asset management database as part of a broader effort to maintain facilities. Um, so next slide, please. A few examples here of barriers that were found just to give you a sense of the breadth uh, of the barriers found. So one is a faded uh, accessible parking sign, a lot of uh, parking uh, issues were identified at park and rides and transit centers. In this particular case, it's a faded sign that needs to be replaced uh, at the Woodbury Theater park and ride. The uh, photo on the right is a photo of some stairs that are a part of uh, the Empire Wastewater Treatment Plant uh, public uh, tour route. So that was a strong emphasis of the self-evaluation was of that public tour route because um, we wanted to make sure that we were identifying that it was a fully accessible route from start to finish. And if not, um, examples of where it was inaccessible uh, with uh, a request that it be relocated. And so there's efforts underway to identify uh, and uh, do a full review of our routes and where we could relocate them uh, or modify them based on accommodation requests uh, for individuals. Next slide, please. Transit barriers found uh, here at, uh, some additional uh, barriers here again to provide you with that breadth. So these are at uh, two transit facilities. So the photo on the left is of a receptacle that's in the way of the clear floor space that's needed to use the uh, automatic uh, door uh, feature. Uh, and so it's uh, in this particular case, we're talking about a lower level barrier where it's a matter of working with public facilities to identify a better location for that receptacle. Photo on the right is a bit trickier because this is about modifying a walkway uh, to address uh, cross slope issues. And so as you see here, it's a, a curb cut next to 
uh, an enclosed uh, structure, the uh, the shelter where it's uh, there's built in lighting there. And so you have electrical concerns there if you were able to, if you were considering moving that facility and you have the trash receptacle there again, where it's a public uh, facilities uh, issue. Um, but that cross slope. Uh, poses a concern for folks who are coming from this is the 38th Street light rail station who might be coming off of the light rail um, that is going south towards uh, the airport and uh, then turning around uh, from that accessible route and trying to enter into uh, the shelter. So that is a concern there of a, a higher concern than the photo on the left. Next slide, please. Broadly across the council, uh, just wanted to bullet point some of the work that has occurred using that funding. So there was the ADA self-evaluation. There was also digital accessibility efforts to improve the user and accessibility um, components of our website. So we had testing done by an organization called WECO, another local MCUB uh, that uh, provided the, the testing and the testers of various disabilities as well as reports on that work. So the Metro uh, Transit website um, provide, uh, was received a, a full uh, report and remediations uh, are being finalized to make sure that that website is digitally accessible. There's also an organizational assessment done of our broader digital accessibility practices. So this would be what training is available for folks around creating accessible documents. Where do our document templates reside? How is it being communicated where those document templates reside and things like that. In 2020, we then put in place that ADA transition plan, uh, updated the accessibility policy. Um, we conducted based on the results of that organizational assessment, a pilot uh, of uh, the Minnesota IT services accessible word document training, a very robust module based training uh, that is now required for staff based on various job classes to try to get that baseline uh, education around document accessibility, which is so very important, especially as these documents uh, make their way to committees to the <coughs> council and make their way under our websites. Additionally, ADA design training was conducted to environmental services and Metro Transit uh, staff as a follow up to uh, those um, those reports that were received. Es essentially, the, the point being uh, that we want to make sure that uh, engineering uh, staff, that maintenance staff are trained on what ADA compliance mean, what design standards mean, what in some cases Minnesota Accessibility Code means. So that way we are implementing going forward in an accessible manner so we're not having to retroactively address inaccessible um, uh, items that uh, ultimate, ultimately can be more costly than just proactively doing the work. Next slide, please. Uh, a few examples of Metro Transit work that was completed. So there was some restriping of park uh, park and rides kind of related to the um, to that photo I showed of the faded accessibility sign. Uh, there were truncated domes. That's the tactile, uh, oftentimes yellow um, uh, pads that are put down on curb cuts uh, to make it more um, uh, to make uh, individuals who are blind or of low vision uh, more aware of where they are located in relation to our facilities and to our uh, vehicles. Uh, we installed several what are called ADA pads. So those are those flat landing surfaces, five by eight feet uh, surfaces next to um, oftentimes the, the T sign. So this is where folks are boarding and alighting and making sure that there's a flat surface for individuals. Um, and then in 2020, we updated the pavers at Robbinsdale Transit Center uh, and received designs for modifying the, um, the Haywood first floor bathroom that's across from the uh, chambers there. And then installed an accessible route from the uh, Transit Control Center green lot to connect with um, uh, the rest of the Haywood facility. Next slide, please. And then here's a, a few photos of the completed ADA projects. So on the left is the Robbinsdale paver project. And then on the right is the installation of an ADA pad uh, along Route 63. Next slide, please. 
So uh, 2021 work that uh, is uh, to occur. So this is just a, a floor plan for the um, Haywood first floor bathroom. So as I mentioned, it's being remodeled to be fully accessible. This is uh, based off of the findings from JQP and that self-evaluation. So there'll be an installation of accessible stalls uh, in both rooms, as well as fixtures uh, that will be ADA compliant, including the sinks and the toilets, uh, and, as well as better lighting and ventilation, uh, as those will be in higher use as we start to use the, the chambers more. Next slide, please. For environmental services, so the work to, uh, that they uh, completed over the last couple of years is primarily around uh, power assisted door installation and making sure that uh, entrances are accessible. If you don't have accessible entrances, that's a the huge issue in being able to access the facilities. Uh, last year in particular, they did a lot to improve the accessibility of bathrooms, so really identifying bathrooms, especially public uh, bathrooms as needing to be remodeled, uh, as well as adding in those power-assisted doors. So there was a lot of work across a handful of uh, treatment plants, as well as the, the main metro plant uh, um, around that work. So next slide, please. And then for this year, what they're looking to finish up is a lot of that work that they started last year because of COVID. Uh, a lot of the work that was started last year was delayed and not able to be completed. Uh, and that work started a bit later uh, in 2020 because the self-evaluation was completed at the end of 2019. And so in order to establish these projects, uh, they really didn't get off the ground until uh, springtime. And then again, with COVID, they were delayed. And so this work is looking to be completed this year. Uh, and that's to, uh, with environmental services to finish up the, uh, the main entrance and the bathroom uh, remodeling efforts. Next slide, please. So the budget breakdown. So again, we were given uh, nearly, there was a lot of nearly uh, $2 million to uh, essentially kick off the ADA improvement efforts. And this is kind of a breakdown of the estimated costs for those um, various efforts and the actual cost. This was in, uh, for 2019. I wanna move on to the next slide. Further breakdown for 2020, this is where kind of the work really started in earnest. And so this breaks down the estimated cost and shows the actual cost. And uh, in many cases, it, it was less than what was estimated um, to, to get this work done. But it just shows you in some cases where, uh, uh, where the effort was a little more costly than in other areas. Um, and just wanted to be transparent about the breakdown of those costs. So next slide, please. 2021, so this is the budget request to complete these projects, as I mentioned. So we're looking to finish their digital accessibility work. So we have uh, some outstanding requests for WECO to do some user and accessibility testing and some consultation as follow-up for our website redesigns and our applications, uh, some additional uh, follow-up design training for environmental services, uh, given their unique work. Um, and then to finish up that first floor bathroom in the FTH building, as I mentioned, they got the designs. And so now it's uh, the construction contract needs to be put into practice here. And then for environmental services, it's uh, to finish uh, the addition of the power assisted doors and the bathroom remodeling that started last year. And uh, next slide. So this is my contact information. So I'm happy to field any questions right now. And I'm not sure if I did invite uh, Molly Ellis, who is the uh, project manager for the FTH bathroom remodel, as well as the two project managers for environmental services. It's uh, Dan Fox and John Young, in case they are able to answer any specific questions about those projects. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Any questions from council members? Some good work. Councilmember Gonzalez, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Chair. And thank you, Guthrie. I remember the similar presentation to this, uh, I think about two years ago, and I believe the, somebody from JQP was at the, one of the first uh, EAC meetings that I attended, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and I was impressed by how thorough they were in pointing out uh, issues that may be out of um, situations of out of compliance with the ADA. 
So my question is, are the expenses that, w that you just um, <clears throat> went through, are those uh, related to issues that they discover? Um, and, if, and also the second part is, um, are there any other issues or improvements that they suggested that still need to be done? In other words, in other words, it, are we are we following up on their recommendations, and that's the basis of the, the expenditures? And if if there's going to be an endpoint, or if there's going to be more issues coming up due to their recommendations? Yes, and yes. So the okay. um, Yep. So the, this work is directly tied to the um, uh, to the findings from JQP. This is kind of that first phase where they wanted to identify often and often, uh, oftentimes uh, the most prominent issues. Again, issues where you uh, you have entrance uh, uh, inaccessible entrances to buildings where folks can't access those buildings. Very public facing, and so addressing those and packaging those. Uh, was the initial priority and the work is ongoing. So as that transition plan is updated on an annual basis, so will the uh, goals for that year. Um, and it's it's a lot of work. As I mentioned, there were over 3,000 barriers that were identified and we wanna make sure that we're not adding to that list uh, with the work that we're doing. Uh, and so that's where that training comes in. Uh, that's, that's very critical and kind of finishing up that core training for staff so that they are not only making Making remediations, but they're making sure that with new construction too, uh, that we're not um, falling into that same pattern of, of making some of our uh, our efforts inaccessible. Thank you, Mary. Did you have a comment? You're on mute, Mary. Thank you. Uh, just a reminder that um, we use some general fund money to seed. Um, getting started on this, kind of a drop in the bucket, but we wanted to get something started. And part of this budget amendment is to finish up using some of that general fund money that we had targeted towards this. But there is an expectation for the operating divisions to to put this either in their capital maintenance in the CIP or within their operating budget to continue on this work. So in the budget amendment today, we're, we're kind of finishing up some projects that we had initially started and um, we're continuing to work through that list at the operating division level. Okay, Council Member Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I really appreciate this report and I also really appreciate the um, comments that Council Member Gonzalez gave because I was thinking the same thing. So thanks for that answer as well. And again, I really support this. I know it's a big lift, but to see this, uh, you know, in process and, and, you know, we'll get this work done is a good feeling. So thanks for all your hard work and really, again, appreciate the report. Mr. Mr. Chair, um, kind of on that same vein, um, one of the reasons that I wanted the group to bring this back as we brought this budget amendment is oftentimes we put general fund money into things to get them started, but then we never come back and say, hey, here's what we did with that money. So this is kind of our, our report back to you about the work that I, that is getting done with that money. Really good work. Great. Councilmember Lee. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I saw the line item for ADA pads uh, with only $43,000. And my question is how, how many pads is that? And how how do we decide where, which stops do we put them at? And then um, I have one comment um, uh, about the um, the picture for the handicap sign that was mentioned earlier. Um, I, I don't have a JD, but I, I heard, once heard somewhere that um, those spots are only enforceable if you have both the sign up and the uh, white striping on the on the ground, and so I'm sure um, you you guys are also going to redo the the white painting on the on the uh, pavement too. Um, that's it. Thanks, uh, Council Member uh, and and uh, committee. Uh, so yes, you're right. So in those cases where we've got a faded accessibility sign, we are also looking at that report to see if there's um, faded, uh, you know, painted lines and making sure, because in some cases the painted lines aren't even faded. It's a matter of whether or not they're wide enough, right? Or um, the accessible, um, 
the accessible path next to it uh, is appropriately designated, that the access aisle is appropriately painted uh, and available and it's wide enough. And so that's where you get into conversations about packaging it. So if you're identifying that you need to change out some signs, uh, also looking to see if there's some restriping and painting that, uh, that is needed. Um, to your question about the ADA pad installations, so that's a unique one because as you as you see with the 2020 breakdown, budget breakdown, the actual cost was zero. They identified other sources of funding for that. And my uh, recollection is that they've been able to install about 70 or so since the self-evaluation was completed, 70 individual ADA pads. I couldn't tell you exactly the uh, the individual cost you know, it would likely change based on location. Uh, but um, that is a an element of the uh, Better Bus Stops program that is occurring. So mention Route 63 as a uh, example of that Better Bus uh, Stops program where in addition to other uh, improvements being made. They're also adding in ADA pads based on availability. And so in some cases, it's based on the number of limited mobility tags, so uh, as well as lift deployments. And so as you might imagine, a flat landing surface doesn't just benefit somebody who, you know, has a mobility disability, but benefits somebody using a stroller, for instance. Councilmember Barber. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't know for sure how many ADA pads, but um, uh, as Guthrie highlighted pretty well, um, we've been doing a lot of that work through our Better Best Stops program, um, really taking a keen eye to it. And as a result of some of this work that, that was done a few years ago, one of the big things we've done is really proactively engage um, our TAC com committee. Um, so um, looking at not only what we have historically, but as we're doing all this new construction, um, what do we need to factor in from an accessibility perspective? And I think that is improving things as we're building things out and is helping us figure out so that so that we don't have to um, go back and retrofit things further, but we can build smarter into the future. All right, any other comments from council members? All right, Stuart, you're back up. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon. My name is Stuart McMullen. I'm Director of Budget and Operations, and I'm bringing forward the first quarter 2021 budget amendment. With me and available answer questions are Heather Augustin Hebner, Finance Director for CDN MTS, and Ed Petrie, Finance Director for Metro Transit. This amendment makes changes to the operating budget in regional administration, the operating and capital budget in MTS and Metro Transit, and the capital budget in community development. The proposed amendment was reviewed and approved by the Transportation Committee this past Monday, March 22nd, and will be reviewed by the Community Development Committee on April 5th. First, as in support of the work just described by Guthrie, Funds for physical and digital accessibility projects in Metro Transit and environmental services will be added to OEO's regional administration budget. These funds will come out of reserves as part of the 2000 allocation made by the council for this purpose. Next are the changes in the operating budget for the transportation programs. Metro Transit will be bringing in local revenues from Ramsey County for staff work on the Rush Line project. MTS will be moving $1.4 million in MVEST funds from the operating to the capital budget and $1.4 million in federal funds from the capital to the operating budget. This will allow for the funding of capital projects in contract services that cannot be funded with federal or bond proceed dollars. Turning to the changes in the transportation capital budget, the amendment adds or changes the funding for 20 projects and closes nine projects in Metro Transit. It also changes the funding for 30 projects, closes 41 projects, and adds seven projects to the MTS capital budget. The individual changes are listed in Table 9 of the amendment. In the Community Development Capital Budget, the amendment makes changes to three regional parks projects, closes 55 projects in the Community Development ACP, and reallocates funding for 58 parks projects. These changes are listed on table 11 of the amendment. 
The motion is the Metropolitan Council authorizes the 2025-2021 unified budget as amended and in accordance with the attached tables. With that summary, we could answer any questions the committee might have. Are there any questions from committee members? All right, seeing none, can we get a, a motion to approve business item 2021-57JT? Moved by Barber. Is there a second? Lilligren seconds, Lilligren seconds. Right. Moved by Barber, second by Lilligren. Any other questions or comments? All right, seeing none, can we call the roll? Barber. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Lee. Aye. Lilligren. Aye. Ferguson. Aye. Thank you. All right, and the motion carries, and that is our only business item for today. So we have two probably lengthy or somewhat lengthy information items. The first one is our advancing equity in the, the uh, budgeting of the dollars that we had set aside for that. Uh, Mary? Uh, Mr. Chair, Mary. we're going to go with Marie on this one. Okay. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, there is an attachment of this information item I've summarized the total um, for advancing equity in the region to use the general purpose levy um, in equity investments around transportation, reducing racial disparity, housing, and sustainability. Um, the total investment currently is the $5.6 million. Uh, this number includes uh, 300,000 to help with some temporary help, especially around some of the initiatives of hiring uh, for uh, the youth uh, skill programs and uh, for the transportation uh, maintenance technical training. And the funding of the source is the 3.9 that we've talked about. And then taking uh, from our general fund reserves the 1.7 to come up with a total investment for our uh, community of that 5.6 million. I've outlined on that in information item uh, the topics that we've talked about over the last few meetings, um, what that would be used for that funding, the how success will be measured. And I fully anticipate that if these are all approved, just like what we did with the presentation with the budget amendment, we would bring forward um, in the middle or near the end of their cycle to be accountable back to you of how we've spent this money. And then each of the sponsors of, of these projects are, are listed. So I, I think at this point, um, open it up to the floor probably for discussion and see if these are uh, the projects that we would like to move forward for uh, 2021. And each one does have a time frame listed too. Um, some do go out 18 to uh, months to two years to get enough runway to complete these projects. Council members have any questions either on projects funded or not funded or dollar amounts or any things they would like to have added to the commitments around what work will be done for clarification? Let's just start with the first one. Any comments on advancing equity in the region through contracting? Anything we're missing? Mr. Chair, can I 
Yep, Councilman Gonzalez. So I'm just looking at the, and I, we, we had this, we had discussed this uh, particular items and the allocations and all of that. I'm just wondering if, if what we're doing right now with this is basically just setting a, a baseline uh, as to whether the amounts and or the, the specific projects do indeed move the, the needle. I mean, I, I don't know if $600,000, for example, for contracting is going to be enough or not to, to be significant. Is that, but is that part of what we are wondering if, if it is most particular? Okay. So, so the idea is just to get some data and see what happens and then revisit all of this at a later point. Is that my understanding? Yeah. Probably won't, won't revisit numbers until this time next year. Okay, got it. Thank you. So if you don't think that that's enough money, then now would be the time to bring that up. Mr. Chair? Councilor Johnson. Thank you. And I know it's buried in the details and we've talked about this, but just in the overview here, you know, again, um, on the success and measurements, I, you know, we'll, we'll be... Um, project data to be measured and reported, including women BIPOC owned businesses participating, contract dollars distributed to MCUBs in excess of established goal. Um, and, and so to please, just please remind me, do we have goals uh, established with this, not just our regular goals, but like by investing the 600,000, have we set the new benchmark of, you know, what we are hoping to see um, so that we can measure, you know, our, I mean, we can report out what happened, but then, did we set new goals to see if we really reach those goals or what do we, what do we, what do we see would be success in this? Those, those are just, again, I think I keep, you know, I'm kind of on the same thing, but I'm just trying to make sure that if we invest it, we get some things that happen good. Um, you know, how do we know if we're being successful and how do we know if it's sustainable and it will play forward? Yeah. And I would just say, I think, you know, so goals and targets are maybe two different, two, two different things. So maybe targets might be a better way to put it. So goals sort of have a formal definition and DBE programs, but we, I think it would make sense to set targets. We've never set a target for BIPOC, for example, which is separate from setting a goal. The goal cannot be race-based, but the, we could have an internal target of something we're monitoring, um, but we've never um, had a recommendation from OEO uh, on what that target would look like. Well, I want to make sure that, you know, to your point, you know, we want to, we want to do this in the right way. I just think that for me and the backside of all this, you know, did we accomplish what we were trying to accomplish at the levels that we had hoped we would get? And so if that's a target or whatever, um, and it's okay to set something like that, I mean, I'd like to, I'm not opposed to this. I just always want to know, you know, what is success in our minds? And uh, when we look at the numbers and then, you know, are we, are we confident, you know, that, we can continue to roll this forward so that when the money goes away, you know, we still have some outcomes that we are trying to achieve. So it's more or less just my mindset on this so that on the back side of this, we go, okay, we we not only did what we targeted to do or pick the word, um, we, but we beat it. And we're finding that these contractors are really now embracing this. Those, those would be the kinds of things that I'm looking for. Yeah, and I think the challenge we also have is, is you know, if we're advancing more racial equity, right, we could accomplish all of these and not move the racial equity needle one bit, right? So that's, but that's sort of the common problem. It's been the problem in Minnesota for 40 years, right? So. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Thank you. So I don't, Mr. Think, I don't think this changes that per se. Right. Mr. Chair and committee members, I think this, we're trying out some things in a pilot. And and we we look at this and we see say do we get the outcomes that we were hoping for of that pilot, and if we get those outcomes that we're hoping for, then we have a budget decision to make in the future about how do we want to continue this program because we see it as being successful. So I think it gives us the information to make a educated decision about a future budget. Any other thoughts? Good. 
Chair, Council Go Members, ahead. this is Cy Jordan, Director of Equal Opportunity. And so, Council Member Johnson, I do want to be responsive to your question with the request for the item number one. We'll be able to measure growth between the goal that we do set on an individual product or, or project or goods and services and how far the contractor goes above that goal. So we'll be able to have that as a measure of whether or not we want to continue those kind of incentives. For the second um, item, it will be dependent upon the experiences of the apprentices and their success and the contractor's experience as well, which um, the Workforce Development Unit will uh, work with those contractors on. For the third item, the off-speak opportunity is using this as it is one-time funding. And so based upon our limitations and capacity for the remainder of 2021, um, that is the amount we're requesting to set up that development office that will move us into that work planning that will set those targets and focus areas for um, growth and opportunity and reducing the racial disparity gap. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, if you know when we get if we when we get the data back, so thank you, Sai, for that. That's great. Um, it, and I'd like to see previous years before this pilot project so that we can compare um, if contractors were exceeding the goals before. Um, not 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 probably to the degree we would want if they're not even meeting them or exceeding them. But you know, those are the things that I just want to be able to see in the future, so we can just track that progress. To your point, um, Mary, then. We've got some, we're, we're armed with good data to show, hey, this was a good investment or hey, it was a marginal, it, it marginally moved the needle, right? So that's that's all I'm trying to find. And I really appreciate, I really appreciate all of staff's work on this. Thank you. Yeah, the tricky part will be is it may be if, if we award it on one contract, if that contractor doesn't do anything, does that mean that the whole concept doesn't work? Or if that contractor does amazing work, does that mean every contractor will do amazing work? Right, either way. I think that the challenge that I had earlier was just in trying to do it only on one contract is, you know, anytime you're trying to figure out if something's working or not, having an N of one is a, uh, creates a significant amount of error in that in that conversation, so. Mr. Chair, mm -hmm. to Go that ahead. point, uh, would, would uh, not to get in the weeds and make life horrible for staff, but would before the determination um, of where that money goes, would it come back to management for us to say, hey, here's the one or three or five or whatever, you know, here's what we're looking at using this money for uh, given contracts coming up. Would we be able to see that to kind of go, yeah, instead of one, it could go over here to of several or once we've locked in, it just, it kind of meets a criteria and a prioritization that is kind of out of our hands. That's a good question. I don't know. Sai, how are you going to determine which contract you're applying that to? Or Jody? I'm sure. Sorry, Chair. Council members, I need to find my uh, mute button. We will be, the Office of Equal Opportunity will be working closely with procurement to make that determination. And that is um, certainly a position that we can take in bringing that back to before we um, actually apply it to a particular project or, con or contract as we're moving forward in both setting the goal for the project and then um, making a decision on uh, applying this particular incentive to that project. Jody, any further yes. comments? Finding my unmute button, Mr. Chair and Council Members, I absolutely concur with Sai that we can continue to provide information to the Management Committee as we um, learn more information again about the upcoming projects and then absolutely have those conversations with the business units to find out which projects have a significant amount of opportunity so that not only the contractors, all the contractors exceed, succeed, but also that the project is a good fit for it and we have that outcome that we're looking for. So uh, we can commit to you to continue to keep you informed of what the status is as these projects move forward. And we're really excited for this opportunity. Yeah, it might be useful to look at contracts where in the past where, you know, maybe one uh, vendor bid at, you know, they said they could hit a 20% goal and someone else said they'd hit a 5% goal, you know, where there's a, you know, so that way then you could see if that's enough to 
encourage people just because they they run their businesses differently, right? They have a different. So that would just be a thought of the type of contract uh, that would make the most sense. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chair and committee members, I absolutely concur. And I see Lisa's on here as well. And we'll just continue to partner with the uh, business units, especially both engineering departments to make sure that we have the right projects for this as well. And uh, some subcontracting opportunities and just some opportunities to make sure that we get, again, the outcomes that we are looking for. Okay, any other comments on this business, on this part of it? Just briefly, if I can. Uh, Go ahead, Francisco. Chair. Um, appreciate the conversation. And, and of course, we all know that um, uh, we have, a, a, at least myself and I speaking for Chris Ferguson is that um, we do have an interest in issues of contracting and without trying to get in the way of staff, I would really like to see, and that's just for me to understand the weeds and the mechanics of how this works. If we can get like a case sample or one of the projects or, or contracts that, that we're trying, thinking of putting through this process, if we can take that from you know, this is the, the, the project, these are the criteria, this is how we are evaluating. <clears throat> Have like a live example of one of these situations, how would that work? So I can understand how staff analyzes and approves this. So um, I, I hope that makes sense. I just want to, to get to know more about the mechanics of how this works. And I'm just thinking that this could be an opportunity to do that. Okay. Mr. Chair, um, Council Member Gonzalez, absolutely. Sai and I can partner with that to give you just a sliver of the mystery behind the process so that you understand from initiation <laughs> and all the different pieces that go in through bid submittal to evaluation all the way up to award. And I think it's just a great opportunity to talk about, you know, what's happening to help everyone understand roles and responsibilities so we can get to that outcome. So I hear you and Sai and I'll work together to coordinate a presentation that has that information. Thank you, I appreciate it. Another one I'll make more work for you is just that we have that particular interest. So thank you very much. And it'll probably take a little bit of work just to advertise that opportunity for people because it's mm -hmm. not part of our standard bid package as well. So, mm -hmm. all right, any other final comments on this one? All right, the second one, I think we, we all know well, it's it's simply adding additional funding to our local housing initiatives account. Um, as you can tell, that is more than the, the total amount we were talking about before. We decided to take additional money from general fund reserves and apply it to this program so that we could um, adequately fund or properly fund what they were uh, requesting for to be able to, to put in this program. So that one, I think, is fairly... Uh, so but any questions on that one? The third one is environmental services job skills program. Any any questions on that? That one I think everybody liked that concept. So the next one is the equity evaluation of regional transit investment. So this one, uh, just one thing to note, it's, it's a little bit less money than they were originally requesting, but a piece of work that I think there's a number of people that felt we should move up in the timeline uh, and, and get it started this year, uh, just given the impact that it has on a lot of other things that we do uh, at the council. The next one was the maintenance technical training, which um, we have in essence, I think, done something similar before with with great success. So this is having another cohort of people. Remember, these were the ones that we looked at whether or not it was possible to do more because people like these these concepts and the, and the challenge is just really to uh, manage the number of people coming through the program and the opportunities would be available and people be uh, getting ready to graduate. And so wanting to match those up and I think um, Brian uh, Funk and others um, you know, picked a number that 
that we would uh, ensure that we would have um, have jobs available for for people as they come in. The, and then the, the last one that we have on the list is a expanding multicultural marketing reach and frequency. And so this is and this is one that um, I think we we actually added a little bit to just just the sort of things that we wanted them to work on, but leveraging some of our metro transit um, assets and just broadly combining that with some of our uh, with our various components of our some of the other uh, racial equity work that we want to do and. Um, so using our, not just doing it brought more broadly thinking about how we, how we want to market in the space and, and do some of this communication. So that might be one to just read if there's things that we're missing that you, that were, that people brought up in the, in the last session, let us know and we can, um, we can add them to the, uh, to the thought of the list. So, Mr. Chair, I think the next steps for this will be to um, bring it to the council as a recommendation from the management committee. Um, it requires a budget amendment as well because we're proposing using some reserves to to transfer to the the um, pass through account. Um, so that's probably our best way of bringing it forward to the to the council and talking about it. Um, would you like at the council for us to do any further presentation of these items? You know, I, I think it would be good to do try to do like a, a one slide if we can presentation to let people know some of the special projects that we're you know that we're working on. Yeah, really focusing on out outcomes. Yep. Yes, absolutely. Great. We can certainly do that. And Mr. Chair. Councilor Johnson. Two things. Um, I know I've asked this before. I just keep asking things because I forget what I ask sometimes. Yes. But um, uh, and all of this is going through the Equity Advisory Committee as well, right? Just I mean, we're all we're all in line with their support and input, and you know, to to amplify you know what we're what we're doing here. And 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 I think you said we took into consideration their insights before we came up with this. Or could you just remind me what their role is? And then my second point is. Um, for the um, uh, council meeting where we bring this up, yeah, one pager, I agree with the chair. And then maybe just a really nice bullet pointed stuff for Mr. Chair to answer all the questions if we get them. Because <laughs> this is this is a lot of work and a lot of lift, and, and I really do appreciate it. Uh, there's a lot of detail in this, so some people might have questions, but I do appreciate this. Thank I will you. let Councilman Gonzalez talk about the Equity Advisory Committee and how this fits in with their work? Uh, my understanding is that we did discuss this, uh, some of the, I don't recall, Sai, if you did a presentation or how was this brought before the EAC? Sai, if you're speaking, you're on mute. Well, I will say that my recollection is that we did discuss several of the uh, individual uh, projects. I and I'm trying to recall, and, and my apologies for um, not remembering exactly what happened. But I seem to recall that we had presentation either by Serinthia or somebody from staff on on. The idea when it first came up, and I have discussed this with uh, Nali Masitati Munene, the, the co-chair. Um, but again, I don't recall, Sai, if, if additional steps were taken to get the, the input from the EAC or not. Well, it seems she's having some technical difficulties. Um, it might be good for us just to close the loop. Um, yeah. If, if we talked about some of these things with them, it might not have been the finalized list. So it might be helpful for us to, to close the loop and, and talk about um, where we're focusing these funds. Mr. Chair. 
Councilor Johnson. Thank you so much. I, I really do appreciate closing the loop. You know, it's a great group of people. They've got some new members coming on, you know, changing of the guard, so to speak, um, with with uh, Nalima moving off. But, you know, I think that if 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 now is not the time to really fully engage that group and um, consistently keep them in line with what we're doing and what they're doing, um, I don't know when the time would be. So I appreciate that. And, and thank you, Councilmember Gonzalez, for your leadership with that group. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Robert, do you have something? Sorry. Councilor Gonzalez, do you have another comment? Oh, just briefly. Uh, what I will do is I'll I'll uh, reach out back to the to the EAC members and, and have a conversation. We we don't have a meeting until scheduled until next month. So we'll we'll do some uh, you know online discussion and, and if there's any questions I will bring it back to to this group or to the to the council. Great. Mr. Chair. Councilman Barber. Yep. Oh, I'll go after Councilman yeah. Barber. Thank yeah. you. Councilman Barber, go ahead. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, um, as this goes forward, I will support this. I do want to point out something that I still do have concerns about the LHIA um, funding. And a little bit even more now that we're pulling money from the general fund reserves. Um, we did that when we funded the program. Like, And in, in for this year, we put some additional money in there. And if we do this again next year, um, I would like to see that happen with the act that the, the, the work through the Community Development Committee um, outlining that program going forward, because to me, this money out of the general purposes levy is our chance to impact change with new things, just to see, like we talked, there's a lot of innovation built in here and ways for us to try things on to see if we want to fund them in the future. You know, that was how the tech, or, or the, the uh, mechanics um, program was initially developed. It was through an equity grant through this this type of funding, and it worked, and so we funded it you know, through division budgets going forward. And so, you know, to me, um, like I said, I will, when we're talking about this to full council, I will support this, but um, I think, you know, we should look at this when we're planning both the livable communities program next year and the budgeting timing of, of how this works. If that's a priority, we can fund it as part of that. Um, and so, um, especially when we're pulling from reserves. Just a comment, but I will support it, all of this going forward. But this is our chance to innovate and try things. And I don't feel like just putting money into an existing program is necessarily innovation. Any other thoughts or comments? All right. Thank you all. Uh, I think. We will uh, we'll proceed with the list that we have and then bring that as a budget amendment to uh, to council. Mr. Chair, sorry. Councilor Johnson, sorry. So does this go to community development then? Since it's, you know, to council member Barber's point, would it go to, would it go to that group and then go to the Met Council, uh, the full Met Council? I mean, because we, you know, and we have our chair of community development with us, Council Member Lilligren. I mean, we really did have some robust discussions even about our funding this year and what we were trying to do. And there are changes to some of our programs as it relates to equity outcomes. So that is very good. And, you know, we all know there's never enough money to close the gaps for all of the projects that are in line. Um, but I do appreciate Council Member Barber's comments about trying to innovate and spark some new ideas around this. So I don't know. I, I, I don't chair that committee, but I just think that the, the point was well taken, Council Member Barber, when you mentioned maybe it should loop through um, community development. Because, um, boy, do we have a lot of discussion there about stuff like this. But, you know, I, I just wanted to throw that out there. Mr. Chair and committee members, I see this one coming from management committee directly to the council. Yeah, and hey. Mr. Chair, thanks, thanks, Mary, and uh, thanks, Councilmember Barber, for bringing this up. And and there has been a really intensive look through the uh, housing policy work group, and with the involvement of the community development committee, it's been two kind of points where this is I think is really hitting. One of them is on innovation, and I'm glad you. You brought that up, and and actually the sense of the work group was that uh, LHIA account is a good spot for innovative innovation projects, 
And so I think you'll see more of that kind of coming forward through the work of the housing policy work group. And the other is just about production and how the market is behaving as uh, housing production ramps up and that the uh, affordable end of the market is not ramping up at the same pace. And so this was the thinking behind increasing LHA is informed, I think, by what's happening in the market. And I hear you, Council Member Barber, I think it's important that that we keep this on our radar and, and if it is a priority, figure out how to bring it into the budgeting process. Okay, Mr. Chair and committee members, our commitment to you as well is to come back and report on progress on these and whether we're reaching the outcomes that, that we um, put this innovation money towards. So, thank you. Thank you. All right, any other comments on on the advancing equity in the region package? All right, does somebody have a motion for me? Mr. Chair, I move the, that we close this meeting under Section 13D.03, Subdivision 1 of the Minnesota Statutes, so we can consider a labor development and negotiation um, related to labor strategy.